morning, church family. I'm so thankful with everything that's going on in the world today that we serve a God and a King who reigns above it all. So let's praise Him together this morning.
to the table He will satisfy Taste of His goodness Find what you're looking for For God so loved The world that He gave us His one and only Son to save us Whoever believes in Him Will live forever Take a moment and have a seat and check out this video. It's Shoebox Day. If you've packed a shoebox for Operation Christmas Child, please make sure to drop it off at our table right here in the worship center. That way we can send these boxes off on their journey throughout the world so that they can bless kids everywhere with the hope and love of Jesus. But our work isn't finished yet. Please keep praying that God would reveal himself in a powerful way to the recipients of our gifts and transform their lives. And as we also pray for transformation in the lives of people whom God has placed around us where we live, work, study, and play, we encourage you to intentionally reach out this Christmas season with a backyard Christmas party. It's pretty simple to do. You can create a party almost anywhere and invite anyone. When Joy and I did this a few winters ago, we had no clue what it was going to look like but we knocked on the 38 doors on our street and invited them to our backyard for a party. We had around 30 people show up and we are so glad that we had this party. We finally got to know the people we've been waving at for six years and our neighbors were so appreciative. And the next year, it sparked one of our neighbors leading the charge to have a Christmas party for our street. 
God is still using this parties in our neighborhood and we don't even live there anymore. Hosting a party in your neighborhood doesn't have to be your whole street. Just invite the five or so houses that are closest to you. Our staff team would love to help you make this a success and we'd love to pray for you and the people that God brings to your party. So please let us know the basic details about your party. You can send us a communication card, or if you'd like for us to print out some invitations for your party, you can send us the web form on our Backyard Christmas Parties webpage at discovercentral.org slash backyard party. On that webpage, you can also check out some of the stories from some of the people who hosted Backyard Parties last year. But if you want invitations, we need you to send us that web form today. That way we have enough time to get your invitations back into your hands before your party. We're excited to hear about all the great things God does to connect us to the people around us. And we also have a great tool for you to use so that you can connect with others throughout the Christmas season. That's right, our very own home-baked Season with Love Christmas devotional is coming next week. 25 days of heartwarming thoughts about the importance of Jesus' arrival in our world, all written by members of our central family. We'll have those devotional booklets available for you to pick up and share with others. It might even be a great gift to give away to the people that come to your backyard Christmas party. Well, we do this stuff to show love to others because God loves these people. And God loves us, every single one of us, with an intense, never-ending love that led him to give his own son for us. So let's express our love and gratitude to God now. All right, you can go ahead and stand as we continue to worship together. All my words fall short I've got nothing new How could I express All my gratitude I could sing these songs As I often Every song must sing, you never do. So I throw my hands and praise you again and again. Cause all that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah. But I'm nothing else fit for a king Except for a heart singing hallelujah Hallelujah I've got one response I've got just
So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again. Cause all that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah. And I know it's not much, but I've nothing else fit for a king. Except for a heart singing hallelujah,
we just thank you, God, for who you are. God, we thank you, Lord, for what you've done for us. We thank you for dying for us, Lord, and for raising from the dead and giving us resurrection power. We thank you, God, for eternal life. We thank you, God, that everything in, that we do in this life matters, God. It matters to you, even the small things, God. I pray, Lord, that as the minister comes to preach today, God, you would just speak through him, speak to our hearts, speak to our minds, Lord, and change us, Lord. Lord, I pray that we will remember what we hear today, Lord, and what we learn throughout the week, and we'll apply it to our lives, Lord, in our interactions with others. And it's in your name that we pray, in Jesus' name. Are you familiar with the movie Castaway? Starred uh, Tom Hanks. It was released in the year 2000. And uh, in that movie, you have Tom Hanks' character, and he's deserted on this desert island. And, uh, you know, he's so alone that he begins talking to the volleyball that he names Wilson. And, you know, you just see the loneliness of it, just being, like, isolated there for so long. But did you know that the writer of that movie, William Broyles Jr., in order to do a little research and to prepare to write the script... He studied survivalists, okay? He spent a lot of time just studying survivalists and what life, what life was like for these people. And he actually took the study so seriously that he isolated himself on a desert island for a while. And some of those experiences that he had in isolation, he actually worked those into the script. And one of the things that you realize real quick just from watching a movie like that is, man, we need people, you know? I mean, we all might need our alone time from time to time, but wow, we need people, And really, in a sense, that's kind of what we celebrated yesterday with Veterans Day, right? That we're so thankful. And by the way, as Central, we're very thankful for those of you who have served in the armed forces to protect the freedoms that we enjoy in this country. Uh, But it it just highlights that we that we need people. That none of us can protect the the freedoms and everything that we have alone. That 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 we were made for community. We're made to be in relationship with people. In fact, the other week, Steph and I, we were talking just about how people have added value into our lives. We were just kind of reminiscing about all the different people who have been in our home over the years. And one couple that we kind of remember and we're talking about, their names were Bill and Carol. They were in their 80s at the time. They're both with the Lord now. Uh, but they were part of an impact group that, that met in our home. And uh, Carol, she had had a stroke, and so it was difficult for her to speak. She couldn't speak very well, but she always had a smile. And she would squeeze your hand, and she would hug my kids, and she loved seeing them. And, and she was just a joy to be around, even though she didn't have many words. And then there was Bill, and Bill, he had a couple inches on me. He was a tall guy, and he too was just joyful, always had a smile. And um, he, he also was a man of few words, so neither one of them said much. Carol, by necessity, Bill, just by personality. But even though neither one of them said much, just them being there said a whole lot. Because I think everyone in the group recognized that it was a sacrifice for them to be there. That it it took effort for them to be there. Their present sufferings that they were going through and just the struggles of life as you age were obvious. And yet here they were adding life and value to the group. And so when times would come, and they did come, when Bill and Carol would need a meal... Listen, we didn't have to ask the group twice, okay? I mean, they had as many meals as they needed because everybody's stepping up. Hey, whatever you need, right? Because we love these people because they had demonstrated their love for us. And we recognize, too, that uh, for them to be in an impact group, and that probably not, may not have been the way that, like, church operated, you know, when they were younger. But here they are now, and they're, and they're bought in, and they were excited, and they were a joy, and they added value to the group. And I think we added a little bit of life and value to them as well. There was this life-giving community that took place. Well, we're in a series right now. We're just looking at key questions that we really believe that, okay, if we're asking one another these questions, that we will spur each other on toward growth and toward spiritual maturity. And so this is the third week now. The first week, we're asking the question, okay, how am I being changed by Jesus? Last week, we were asking the question, okay, who's pouring into me? Who's discipling me? And who am I discipling? And this week, we're asking the question, where are you experiencing life-giving community? Where are you experiencing life-giving community? As you look at the early church, one of the things that you see really quick is here is a church 
that does not have much in the way of material resources. Here is a church that does not have any really political connections. And yet here is a church that God would use to change the world. And how did he use them to change the world? Well, they were uh, deeply established in the gospel. They were empowered by the Holy Spirit. And they were fiercely devoted to one another. Let's check it out this morning. Acts chapter 4, verses 32 through 37. Acts 4, 32 through 37. The example of the early church continues to challenge and encourage us today. Luke writes, Now the full member of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many who were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to each as any had need. Thus, Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, as we get into the passage this morning, I just want to take a, a moment and just kind of uh, reorient us to what has happened in the book of Acts uh, leading up to this, to this passage, okay? So as you begin uh, the book of Acts, Acts chapter 1, Jesus, he's about to leave, and so he's telling his apostles, hey, you guys just hang out into Jerusalem until the, Son of, uh, until the Holy Spirit comes upon you, okay? But I'm appointing you to be my witnesses. You're going to go out, you're going to preach the gospel in Jerusalem and all Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth, but you just wait here until you get the Holy Spirit, okay? Then you get to Acts chapter 2, and what happens? The Holy Spirit, okay? It's the day of Pentecost. It's incredible. The Holy Spirit comes. Peter begins preaching. 3,000 people are saved, and as they're saved, you see the unity of the church. It's just incredible that they begin by being fiercely devoted to one another. Then you flip over to Acts chapter 3, and in Acts chapter 3, you get this little snapshot of ministry, All right, Peter and John, they're walking along, and as they're walking, there's a lame man, and he's crying out, hey, I need some money, I need help. And so Peter looks at this guy, and he says, silver or gold I don't have, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. And the lame man did. You know, and when lame men get up and walk, people take notice of that, you know? And so that's what's happening. Right? The culture, they're looking at this. They're saying, wow, this is incredible. Peter and John begin preaching the gospel. People are getting saved. It's exciting. It's a great time. And then who's really offended? Who's deeply offended by all of this? The religious leaders. Okay? The same people who had just crucified Jesus or really signed the warrant or handed them over to the Romans so they could crucify him. They're the same ones who are now getting frustrated by Peter and John. So they have Peter and John arrested. They sent them uh, to, to uh, trial in front of the Sanhedrin. It's the, the same community who had heard the trial of Jesus just a couple months ago. And they're listening to the testimony of these guys. And the Sanhedrin's amazed because here's all these educated religious scholars. And they're hearing these two guys talk. And they're looking at them and they're saying, you guys are fishermen. I mean, you're just ordinary, unschooled guys, and yet you speak with such eloquence and such knowledge. This is incredible. And so they just let them off with a stern warning. They they warn them very sternly, okay, you can go, but don't share the gospel anymore. Don't preach Jesus, okay? Be done with that. And, And then they famously respond, and they say, hey, we can't help but talk about the things of which we have seen and heard. And so... Then they go, and it's very interesting. I love this part. As, as they go, they don't say, okay, we got to huddle up. We need a strategy session here. You know, people are kind of coming against us. We're feeling the persecution that Jesus kind of told us. Like, what are we going to do? No, there's no strategy session. You know, they don't come together and say, you know what? We need a fundraiser because we know that our legal fees are going to be astronomical. Maybe if we just go, we can ask the brothers and sisters, you know, to contribute to our legal fund or something. They don't do anything like that. They go back to the brothers and sisters. They go back to the church. They say, look, we got to pray. And so that's what they do. They they go back, and their first response is to pray. Listen, church, this this is an incredible uh, 
example to us because the first response, prayer should always be the first response and never the last resort, okay? No matter what we're going through in life, prayer should always be the first response, never the last resort. You see that with Peter and John. They go back to the brothers and sisters to the church and they begin praying. And the content of their prayer is incredible because they're praying and they say, God, in in essence, God, we know you're not small. God, we know you're not surprised by what's happening God, we know you're not scared by the threats that we're hearing. But God, in light of these threats, will you strengthen us? Will you give us boldness so that we can continue to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ and the gospel? And so as they, as they pray, what happens in the place where they're meeting? It shakes, okay? It's just where they're meeting, where they're gathering, where they're praying, it begins to shake. It's like God's divine amen saying yes. I am with you. I will empower you. This is good. This is right. I I will be with you. I'll continue to empower you. And it's so, it's a dramatic thing. And then, well, that gets to the passage that we just read, where we see this unified church that God was empowering. And in looking at this passage, I think we see several principles that just kind of emerge as to what constitutes true life-giving community. Why this early church was so, one of the reasons why the early church was so, effective um, because of their fierce devotion to one another. And so in examining these, uh, these characteristics, first, life-giving community, it's established in the gospel. If you want to have life-giving community, you've got to establish your community in the gospel because uh, that's the only way it happens. God is the author of life, and so he's the one who gives life. It's got, so biblical community, life-giving community has got to be biblical, it's got to be established in the gospel. Listen, sometimes we try to establish unity and we try to, establish, we try to manufacture commonality in the church. If you've been around the church for any period of time, one of the things that you, that you have seen uh, that has sometimes happened in the church is that we try to make unity happen by dividing into smaller groups of similarities. And so we look and we say, okay, let's do it by age, okay? You know, the old people, they can meet here. And then uh, young married people, they can meet here. Families, they can have this group. And uh, youth, they have their group. And children, they have their group. And so we, go, we just go by age. And that's one way we've done it. Uh, you look at the landscape of the church across America and the history of the church in America. And another way we've done it is by ethnicity. Uh, one, of, one of the ways that we often do it is by gender, right? Men have theirs, women have theirs. Um, and another way, a, a very common way today is socioeconomic status. So, hey, people with money, they tend to go here. People with less, they tend to go there, and et cetera. However, what you see in the early church is that God, he's knitting his family, his people together, and it's not based on any of those features. He doesn't look at any of that stuff. It's simply based on the gospel, It's simply based on a relationship with Jesus. And so understand, we never get over the gospel. We just grow in our application of it. And so it's 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 a deepening of the gospel in our hearts and minds, and that binds us together in a way that nothing else can. The the Bible says that this church at this time, they were one in heart and mind. And I just want to take a minute just just to realize what that means. Because it's estimated at this time that the church was about eight to ten thousand people strong, okay? So eight to ten thousand people. When you consider the scope of the world, not a lot. But when you consider one heart and one mind, that's a lot, okay? And when you look at this eight to ten thousand, you go back to Acts chapter two when Peter is preaching and three thousand people are saved that day. And at that day, who's who's being saved? Peter says that people are there from, uh, that you got Parthenians there, they got Medes there, you got Persians there, you got Romans there, and obviously Jews there. This is not just Jewish, okay? You get, you get a whole different group of people who speak all these different languages, all right? It's very multi ethnic. They're all there, they're all being, so that's the church. They're all one heart and mind. You got both genders represented, you got men, women, children, you got all ages represented. I mean, the diversity of this group is incredible right from the get-go. And yet what unites them? A transformed relationship with Jesus Christ that unites this group together. 
in a way that nothing else can. Um, and part of the emphasis here, you understand, Luke is a doctor, okay? He's very well read, and he would know what people are saying at that time. And one of the dreams at that time was a unified civilization. If you go back and you were to read um, Roman, the Roman philosopher Cicero, this is one of the things that he writes about, a unified civilization. You go back before Rome and you, you look at ancient Greece, and one of the philosophers, uh, uh, philosophers there, his name was Philo, he wrote about the same thing. It was a dream of the ancient world to have a unified civilization, all right? But for the, but for the world, it was just a dream. And here Jesus is establishing his church at the birth of the church when they're all spiritual infants. What happened? They are fiercely devoted to one another. What the world can only dream about, God accomplishes right at the birth of his church. It's incredible. And it would have been a powerful testimony to a watching world, just a fierce devotion to one another. And what's uniting them? A transformed relationship with Jesus Christ. Does it, does it move, remove all their differences? No. It just unites them together under, under him. In his banner, what unites is, is greater and more powerful than anything that could possibly divide. Because it's all these people, and they're coming together and say, hey, we were dead in our sin. And when we're dead in our sin, what do we look for? We try to look for differences, and we try to divide, and that's what the world pushes. But guess what? When we're covered in the righteousness of Jesus, what do we look at? We look at what, you, what unites. And so now we encourage one another, we love one another, we build one another up. This is what's happening in the early church. And so they're of one heart and one mind, and it is incredible. You remember from Acts chapter 2 what they're devoting themselves to, right? So they're together, and they're devoted. These are devoted people. What are they devoting themselves to? Number one, the apostles' teaching, okay, the Word of God. Whatever bit of Scripture they get their hands on at that moment, they're studying it. They are in it, and, and, and they're devoted to it. What else are they devoted to? The fellowship. So get this. They're devoted to God, and they're devoted to the family of God. And then Luke defines what fellowship is. And he says fellowship is the breaking of bread and prayer, okay? Those aren't like two more things they're devoted to. He's just defining fellowship there, all right? So they're devoted to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, which consists of breaking bread, that's communion, and uh, and eating together, and prayer. And where are they doing this? In homes. They're just meeting together in homes. And, And this is what's taking place. And you can imagine, as you're meeting together and you're gathering together in homes, and you're, you're studying the, what the apostles are teaching, and you're talking about that, and whatever bit of scripture you can get your hands on, and someone there who can read it and proclaim it, because it's not like everyone in the room has a Bible, all right? And you're, you're discussing this, and you're just pouring over it. And then you're, you're celebrating communion together, and you're praying for one another because you know the needs of everyone in the group. You know the hopes, the fears, the hurts, what they've left behind, the cost, the discipleship, all these things. What happened? Man, there's intense fierce devotion to one another. And this is what the early church is committed to. This is what they're devoted to. I was reading this week a Barna study about the state of church in America today and what constitutes a regular attender. By the way, that phrase, regular attender, is just horrible, okay? If I can just get past that, it's really hard to attend a person, you know? I mean, Church is a people, it's not a building, and so it already, okay, but if you can just set that aside, okay, just that poor theology aside for a moment, uh, a regular attender, they say today, uh, attends church activities two hours a month, okay? That's regular. Two hours a month, your regular church attender in America today. Listen, I hope none of you are regular, all right? Uh, because if that's regular, listen, it's, it's no wonder that the church is losing her voice in our culture. Because if, do you call that devotion? Two, out, two hours a month, devotion? No, 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 that's nothing. And so what happens is you, we're, we're increasingly in a culture where people are looking and they're saying, you know, I mean, I went to church. I, I tried that when I was younger. And, you know, if it works for you, great. But I tried it. I, I don't know that it really added all that much to me. Why? Because you weren't devoted to it. Right? There's a difference. We, we've done something where we've created this mindset that church is a place you go and it's not who you are. 
that there's these things called church services where you just go and you can sit and watch and be a spectator to the show. And what we read in the scripture is something dramatically different, where it's not a church service. It's a gathering of the saints, where the saints gather together and they're actively worshiping the the true living Son of God. All right? It's not a passive experience. It's a very active one. It's not an act of you being served, but you're, you're gathering to actively participate. And people are saying, hey, I've spectated. I've gone. But what are they essentially saying? I never was, and I wasn't active. When you were active, and church is who you are and not where you go, and church is not a place where you go to be served and spectate, but you go to actively participate in worship, that changes things. You know, that has a way of changing you. That has a way of making you devoted to what's going on and to, to God and to the family of God. And this is what we're seeing in the early church. A devoted people, fiercely devoted to one another because they're devoted to the word of God. They're devoted to the family of God. And it affects everything. All right? The next principle that you see from this passage is that life-giving community is encouraged by sharing testimonies. Okay? You want, to encourage, you want to have a life-giving community where you're encouraged and you're built up, you share testimonies. Um, so when you're, you encourage your community by sharing testimonies, one of the things that uh, we're seeing in the Christian culture uh, today is many churches who are saying, um, you know what, we just need to take the edge off the gospel a little bit. We, we need to kind of soften out some of the harder portions of scripture, just kind of smooth those out. We want to be a little less offensive, you know, more inclusive, and so that everyone can feel comfortable and welcome and all these different things. And so there's a real push for this attractional model in the church today. And it's interesting because if you go back to the early church and this church who had basically no material or very little in the way of material resources, no political connections, uh, and they exploded in growth. How did they do it? Let's just listen to verse 33 again. With great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. In other words, the apostles doubled down on the most controversial thing they could possibly say at that time. Okay? It would be hard to get more offensive than to talk about the resurrection of Jesus Christ at this time. Why? Because everybody who they're talking to, these are the people who had Jesus crucified. All right? They're the ones who had him killed. And what are they proclaiming? Jesus is alive. And so everyone's thinking, you're crazy, you're a troublemaker, or, or something worse, right? This is what's happening. But this is their message they, they can never get over that. Why? Because what makes us different is that Jesus isn't dead, is that he's alive and he transforms us. The doctrine of the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the most distinctive doctrine of the Christian faith. Paul will write that without it, Christians among all people should be greatly pitied. And essentially because we're living a lie, because we bought into this lie. But If Jesus is alive, then the same Holy Spirit who raised him from the dead now resides in us. That's Romans 8, 11. And so therefore it becomes personal, right? Because God, who raised Jesus from the dead, the power of the Holy Spirit, that same Spirit who did that for Jesus now lives in us. So it's personal. Because he's taken us who were dead in our sins and he's made us alive through Jesus Christ as well. It becomes personal. And listen, when things are personal, you talk about it, you know? I mean, when things are just personal, especially personally exciting, right? And energizing and just, you know, in the history of good news, no one ever keeps it to themselves, right? You have good news, what do you do? You share it. Personal good news, it gets out. So one of the things that happens in a, in a healthy marriage as you share your story, you know, you, you, you just talk about it. And the other week, Steph and I, we had the opportunity just to kind of share our story again of how we met. And, and it was kind of fun. We, we, uh, we met at Dallas Theological Seminary. Um, we were taking a class uh, leading the church in worship. She took it as an elective. I was forced to take it, okay? So she wanted to be there. I had to be there. Um, but anyway, we're together and we're, and we end up sitting next to each other and we're talking to each other. 
And as we're talking, you know, she's kind of laughing at me because here I am trying to sing and it doesn't sound too good. And so she's giving me a bad time. And, uh, you know, and I tell her, hey, you know, I, I really need to study for this class. You know, we need to, you, you want to help me study for this, right? And she says yes. And so, you know, even in just retelling the story, what happens? The butterflies start coming back. You know, they're dancing in my stomach again. I'm hearing the birds chirping. It's just exciting. And there's more to the story. And if you want to find her, she can give you all the other details. But, but we, it, it, it's fun just to relive the story and just to remember. And it brings the excitement and the freshness of our love. And it just, it just, it helps it, you know? And this is what happens in a healthy marriage. You rehearse. Just the fun things in life, the things that kind of unite you and bring you back together. You talk about that. And what are the apostles doing here? Well, they're talking about the most transformative thing in their life, a relationship with Jesus Christ. They're talking about the testimony of how he rose from the dead, the resurrection of Jesus. And if you could go back at that time and you understood the cost of discipleship and what it meant for people who were trusting in Jesus Christ in an anti-Christian society, when the church was being persecuted, there was a great cost to it. And so what would happen is you would have a, a, someone who just becomes a believer and they would enter into a, a church gathering and they would declare, hey, here's what I've left to believe in Jesus. Here's what, here's what I've given up to follow Jesus. And in many cases, you're, you're leaving behind your family. You're leaving behind father and mother, brother and sister. And so they're coming and they say, I'm just alone. I've, I've left all this. I believe in Jesus. I know it's real, but I feel alone. And so what's happening? Other people are saying, no, no, you're not alone. We've got you. You're now my spiritual daughter. You're now my spiritual son. You're adopted into this family. We've got you. Right? That's, what, that's the culture of the early church. So you see this devotion. But every time somebody's coming and you're hearing the story again of how, you know what? We left all this behind. Why? Because we know that Jesus is bigger than this. We know that he's the, only, he's the answer. He's everything. So he's bigger. Why would we not leave it all to follow him? And how energizing is that to hear that testimony and to hear it over and over and over again? And this is what the apostles are preaching. Day in and day out, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, they never graduate from it. And it is highly, highly energizing for the gathering of the saints. And listen, uh, it continues to be to this day. As the church gathers and we, we talk about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, it's highly energizing to other believers. If you want to be in life-giving community, you got to be sharing the stories you got to be sharing the stories of, of, of the resurrection of Jesus and how th- that has made a difference in your life and how, how he's transformed your life and how he continues to use you in your life. You know, we had a Men of Impact meeting just the other uh, few weeks ago, and as we gathered together, one of the things is we got in smaller groups and we just shared our stories, just our testimonies of how we came to relationship with Jesus. And then going around the around the group, I got to hear three other men just share their testimony of how Jesus transformed their life. And I got to share my testimony of how Jesus transformed my life. And guess what? As you go through and you hear story after story after story, yeah, there's some differences, but you know what remains the same? Jesus. He's the hero of all of our stories. And when you hear that over and over and over again, what does that create in you? Man, I want to know him more. I I want to be able to worship him better. I want to be more effective as a disciple maker as I'm declaring the good news of Jesus Christ to others. I mean, it is highly life-giving. It's highly energizing and stimulating. The Bible says that as the apostles are preaching the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, that great grace was on them all. You want to invite grace into your life? You continually talk about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You share his story, and you share it over and over again. I want to give you another principle. Life-changing community is experienced in close proximity with other people, right? If you want to have life-giving community, it's got to be done in close proximity with other people. When we're transformed spiritually, we're adopted into a family, A close family, an eternal family, and a healthy family spends time together in close proximity. So you experience community in proximity. 
You know, we could do a survey uh, this morning. We just ask, hey, what, what's really important to you? What do you really value most in life? And in a setting like this, we'd probably get a lot of uh, maybe church-approved type answers, right? Some of us would be genuine, heartfelt. Others, it might be, well, you know, more aspirational, or I feel like this is the right answer. If, you, if we really want to know, though, like what we really value most in life and what's really the most important to us, the most important things in life, all we got to do is follow each other around, you know, for a couple weeks and months, and, and we see where we spend our time and where we spend our money. Because your time and your money are often the biggest indicators of what's really most important to you, where you spend your time and where you spend your money. The early church, they put their hope in the Lord Jesus Christ, and guess what that changed? Where they spent their time. First off, where they spent their time. Now they're fiercely devoted to one another. They are gathering together in people's homes. They're eating together. They're praying for one another. I mean, it is changing how they spend their time. And, and by the way, when you're doing that, like all the flaws come out, you know? It's not like you can hide anything. When, when you just come here uh, maybe once a week, we can kind of put our best foot forward. You know, we can probably kind of put on a, a good front and, and act like everything's good. You know, you can do that. But when you are meeting together and you're eating together week after week after week, everything just gets exposed, right? The craziness of your family, whatever's going on, it just all comes out. So these people, they know one another and they are known by one another. Sometimes in the church, what we do, we can play the performance game where we try to lead with all the stuff we've done to try to show, hey, here's how good I am. Or we can play the pretend game where we act like, hey, you know, I really do have it all together even though we don't. And listen, performance and pretending both deny the gospel. When Jesus is the hero of the story, you know what that frees up? I don't have to perform for him. I get to work in conjunction with him. I'm just resting in him and all glory goes to him. It doesn't go to me anyway. And I don't have to pretend anymore because guess what? He died for me. So I can be honest about what he's done, and then I'm covered in his righteousness. It's not my righteousness. And so that frees me up to be honest about, hey, here, here's, who, here's where I'm at. Here's where I need to be encouraged. Here's where I'm struggling. And I want you to know, because I desperately need you to be praying for me. This is what the early church experienced. They knew each other. They knew their struggles. They knew their pains. They knew their needs. And in knowing their needs, what happened? It affected how they spent their money. And so they were, they were an incredibly generous group because they're looking and they're saying, oh, you have a need? We'll take care of that need for you. Like, we're, we're going to meet that need. And so, hey, they're selling stuff. They're doing whatever it can, they can to make sure that there were no needy people among them. I mean, that, that's an incredible truth right there. That the early church, there were no needy people among them. No one lived in need. Now listen, some people try to take that and say, well, they lived in some kind of like socialistic society where they all just kind of shared everything. And that's kind of, no, 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 this was not forced socialism, okay? This is not like the apostles saying, all right, everybody's got to give this much and then we'll, we'll take care of everybody and we'll pull together and that's what we're going to do. This is not forced socialism. What this is is familial generosity, right? And there's a big difference. Because you know how it is when you're, if you're a part of a good family? When you're a part of a good family, what happens? You got a mom or a dad, a brother or a sister, someone in the family, a son or daughter who's in need. What do you do? Well, you sacrifice. I mean, you figure it out. You try to meet the need. If you're able to meet the need, you meet the need. I'm not talking about enabling bad behavior or continuing to encourage poor choices or things like that. No. I'm talking about legitimate needs. I'm not talking about wants. I'm talking about legitimate needs. And what do you do? The, the family rallies together to meet the need. This is what's happening here, is they look at each other and they say, no, no, we're family now. We're part of an eternal family together, knit together through the blood of Jesus Christ. And so you have a need, we'll meet it. We're going to figure it out. We're going to make it happen. And so those with resources, they're going to incredible lengths. They're selling property, they're selling buildings, selling whatever it takes to meet the needs of of others. It's an incredible example. By the way, in Deuteronomy chapter 15, you see that this is what God wants for his people. God doesn't want his people to live in need. But guess what? In the Old Testament, under the Mosaic law, 
God's people could never get there because they could never fulfill the law. They couldn't get there. But now, under the law of Christ, what happens even at the birth of the church, it becomes a reality. It's transformed living because God has paid it all for us. That's the understanding of the church. God in his son, Jesus Christ, has paid everything for us. Why would I not give what I have to meet the needs of others? Because here's the shift in thinking that takes place. I'm not really owner of anything. I'm a steward of everything. Even this life that I get to live, I'm simply a steward of it. God's the author of life. He's the one who ordained that I be here and walk on this earth at this time. He's the author of life. He's the giver of life. And everything that I have, every talent, my time, uh, all my treasure, my money, whatever I have, all my resources, it's all ultimately God's anyway. I'm not taking any of it with me. So how can I best steward what I have? And that becomes the attitude of the early church. Now, the question for us is, do you have community like this? Do you have community that is this life giving to you where there's a portion of the church family that you're, you're gathering with and you're, you're just wrestling through the scriptures together and you're eating together and you're praying together. I'll tell you, one of the, one of the real phenomenal blessings in my life is to have people who I know are praying for me daily and others who, who I know pray for me weekly. Um, so, some of them are in this room, and I'm, I'm so incredibly grateful to know that there are people in my life who know me. They, they know my struggles, and, and they know my successes, and they're deeply committed to praying for me and my family, and they want the best for us, and I can just be myself, right? And you can do that in a small group. I try to be approachable and just, like, real on stage as much as I can be, like, transparent. But listen, anybody can fake something on stage. When, when, when you're in a, a home together and you're sharing a meal together, it all comes out. You see all the quirks. You see all you know, the messiness. It just comes out. I've had several missionaries who've come through, and, they, and they've told me, uh, Steve, I can't believe it. You're, you're one of the only pastors who actually had us into your home for a meal. And I think that's wild. I'm like, wow, I can't believe people don't do this. But uh, when you live with life-giving community, you'd never want it any other way. You know, when you live with people who you know, they're praying for you, they're rooting for you. You can ask whatever question as you're studying the scriptures together and you can share your insights. You'd never live any other way. So let's get real practical. Uh, where are you experiencing life-giving community? If you know the answer to that right off the top of your head, you, need, you should go to those people this week and just say thank you, right? Thank you for being this for me because I need it. And if you say, you know what, I don't know that I have that. I would like that. I would like people who I know um, can just know me, and I can know them, and we can, we can encourage one another in that way. If you need that, if you want that, you can come talk to me, you can talk to Ethan, and we can do our best to kind of connect you with some others who can be that for you. Because the reality is we weren't made to live on an island. We weren't, we weren't made to live alone. We need one another and we need people who give life-giving community, who will speak the truth of God's word to us, not just empty uh, philosophy of man. So may we be a church that gathers together and is encouraged by each other because we're in life-giving community to one another. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, you are a good God. And we thank you that through, the Son of, uh, through your Son, Jesus Christ, in his death, burial, and resurrection, that we can be made in right relationship with you, adopted into your family. God, and it is a family where the spiritual gifts of others in your family help shape and encourage us so that we can be conformed and grow into the likeness of your son, Jesus. So God, we need, we need to be with people. God, would you give us people and may we be the type of people who encourage and, and give life and add value to what we do. We need your help to do this. So we ask this by the power of your Son, uh, by the power of the Holy Spirit, and the grace of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.